Marcy found a flash drive under the mattress when she was changing the sheets on Emma's bed. We both found it odd. Why was our five-year-old daughter, who can barely work a laptop, in possession of a flash drive? And why was she seemingly hiding it from us? As a parent, it's easy to jump to conclusions. A million different scenarios, each worse than the last, passed through my head when Marcy told me. And judging by the look on her face, her mind was running parallel. Somehow we both stayed calm. We agreed to check it out after Emma was asleep. We wouldn't even mention the flash drive to her until after we'd seen what was on it. That way we'd know how to approach her. Marcy led Emma upstairs and put her to bed around nine o'clock that night. When she came back down 20 minutes later, I'd already plugged the drive into the back of the TV in the living room. She sat down next to me on the couch and we navigated to the correct input. There was only one folder titled Mushi's Barnyard on the drive. We clicked into the folder and four video files popped up. The thumbnail pictures for each video showed a cow hand puppet on a set which looked like a farm. Each was between 20 and 24 minutes long. We turned on the first episode and watched a few minutes. The cow puppet, Mushi, talked about the alphabet and colors and a few other subjects that were perfectly common for a children's show. Marcy and I both sighed in relief. It's just a TV show, Marcy said. Thank God, I replied. I wonder why Emma was hiding it. Hmm, Marcy said. Maybe she got it from Claire's brother. Claire Wilson was Emma's best friend. She lived a few blocks down the road with her parents and older brother Jason. From what I understand, Jason is a bit of a deadbeat. He's almost 30 and spends every waking second in the Wilson's basement playing video games, smoking weed, and drinking with his buddies. What do you mean? I asked, starting to get worried again. Marcy chuckled. Not in a bad way, hon. Claire's probably been watching this Mushi's Barnyard on TV and telling Emma how good it is. And since we don't have cable anymore, she stuck a finger at me in a jokingly accusatory way. Emma can't watch it. Marcy stood up, stretched, the universal sign for time to go to bed, and continued. I'll bet they asked Claire's brother if he could help them, and he downloaded it illegally. He probably told him how he got it, and that's why she hid it from us. I turned Marcy's theory over in my head. It held water for sure, and after I approached it from a few different angles, I couldn't find a hole. Case solved. Marcy took the flash drive out of the TV and put it in the odds and ends basket on top of the fridge. We talked briefly how we were going to approach Emma about this situation and decided that we would focus on the hiding aspect instead of the illegal downloading one. After that, we made our way to bed. I woke up a few hours later with a pit in my stomach. Even though Marcy's theory made sense, I couldn't think of a more logical one. Something didn't feel right. I grabbed my phone from the bedside table and Googled Mushi's Barnyard. No results. The pit in my stomach grew deeper. I decided not to wake Marcy up. It was past four in the morning and she had to be up for work in less than an hour. As quietly as possible, I got out of bed, went down to the kitchen, fished the flash drive out of the basket on top of the fridge and plugged it in. The first episode continued as I remembered. Alphabet, colors, singing, dancing, etc. By the time there were only a few minutes left, the pit in my stomach was all but gone. I'd resigned myself to paranoia. But then it got weird. Time for my favorite part of the show, Mushi sang in a high-pitched voice. It's time to play. Let's help Annie. A woman appeared on the left side of the screen. Her hands were bound so tightly with rope that I could see red marks on either side. The rope trailed away from her wrists and continued off screen. Her hair was greasy and it looked like she hadn't showered in weeks. The look on her face said it all. She was terrified. 
I turned down the volume on the television and moved closer. This woman, Annie, just the sight of her was not normal for a children's show. The way she looked would, in itself, give Emma nightmares. This is Annie, boys and girls, Mushi said. Annie's in trouble, and it's up to you to help her. The farmers caught her stealing some corn, and they say the only way they'll let her go is if you help them with a few things. Annie sniffled a bit, and I saw the rope tighten briefly on her wrist, causing her to flinch. What the farmers want you to do, Mushi continued, is help them with their mouse problem. Mushi pulled out a gallon-sized plastic bag and laid it on the bench in front of him. All you need to do is catch a mouse. I like to use cheese or peanut butter. Put it in a plastic bag, just like this one, and seal it as tight as you can. If enough of you boys and girls do that, then Annie will be just fine. I looked at the TV in awe. What was this? Why were they making children kill mice? And who the fuck was Annie? I'll see you on the next episode, boys and girls, Mushi sang as a little tune played in the background. The video ended. After that, I watched the last five minutes of each of the other episodes, fast forwarding until Annie came into the picture. In each episode, she looked skinnier and dirtier. Cuts and bruises appeared on her forearms and shoulders, and by episode three, she was limping. In each episode, when Mushi introduced the Let's Help Annie bit, he explained that not enough kids had done what the farmers asked. It was the boys and girls fault that Annie looked worse in this episode. And in each episode, the farmers' demands got more worrisome. In episode two, Mushi tells the kids to run away the next time they go to a store with their parents. In episode three, he asks them to go out late at night after their parents are in bed and walk around for a bit. Both worrisome, sure, but episode four is the one that sent me flying up the stairs to wake up Marcy. It's a wonder that she understood anything that came out of my mouth. I was panicking and it all came out like water from a busted hydrant. She rubbed my back to calm me down but I could see that panic was starting to strike her too. Together, we went into Emma's room and woke her up. We found the computer stick under your mattress, sweetie. We wanted to know, where did you get it? Marcy asked. Claire gave it to me, Emma responded, still rubbing the sleep from her eyes. Where did she get it? I don't know, mommy. Have you watched it? Has Claire watched it? I tried to, but Annie was too scary. I didn't kill any mice, Mommy, I swear. Emma's eyes began to glisten with tears. Am I in trouble? Absolutely not, sweetie. But I need you to tell me, has Claire watched it? Emma nodded. She said she watched almost all of them. She was going to watch the last show tonight. Marcy's head began to turn towards me but I was at the top of the stairs before we made eye contact. Within a few seconds, I was out the front door and sprinting down the street towards Claire's parents' house. When I got there, I noticed that the front door was cracked open. Not much, only about the width of a broom handle, but enough to confirm my fear. I didn't have a weapon on me, and I couldn't find anything in the yard. I'd even forgotten my phone on the coffee table. As I sprinted back to my house to call the police, I knew I was too late. The police confirmed it shortly after. In the last episode of Mushi's Barnyard, Mushi says, Good job, kids. You helped Annie. The farmers have decided to let her go, all thanks to your hard work. All you need to do is, after your parents go to bed, of course, call the number at the bottom of your screen. Say your address and unlock your front door. The farmers will drop her off at your house and she'll be safe and sound.